Hey everybody, you are listening to Renewal Cast, a weekly podcast that features interviews, discussions, and teaching on various biblical and theological subjects. And we do this because we believe that our minds are to be shaped and renewed by the life-giving and transforming Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray that for the next few minutes, as you listen, you will see Jesus more clearly. Today on the podcast, we have a special guest with us, Randy White. Now, we are starting a a series on eschatology, on the, the study of the end times. And what we're doing is we're bringing on different people that represent different views. And Randy represents dispensationalism, or to be more specific, classic dispensationalism. So I hope you enjoy our conversation with Randy today. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Renewal Cast. Today, we have a special guest with us, Randy White. And Randy White is going to help us in our series on the end times, our study of eschatology. We're having different representatives from different perspectives come on and, and share their perspective. And Randy, you are well qualified to represent the, the dispensational perspective. Dispensational publishing, is it dot... Dot com. Dot com. Dispensationalpublishing.com. You can go there and find all of his resources. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing you. I'd like you to do that. Would you just take a, a few minutes, tell us a little bit about yourself and about your, your ministry and some of the things that you're involved in. We'd love to kind of get to know you a little bit. Sure. I've uh, been a pastor for all my, uh, all my career, uh, 30 plus years now. And seven years ago, I started Dispensational Publishing House, uh, which does, uh, present uh, Bible study, published Bible study materials uh, from a dispensational perspective, both in in the eschatological issues and uh, just more general Bible study uh, things that uh, would be affected just by taking a uh, dispensational approach to scripture. And so we do that. In addition, at uh, randywhiteministries.org, I do some uh, daily Bible teaching and enjoy uh, living in the beauty of Taos, New Mexico and teaching the word. I pastor a little, uh, a small church here, which I call America's greatest tiny church. And we, uh, just, uh, enjoy digging in the word and seeing what's, uh, in there. And, and, uh, our motto is, uh, in fact, I got it right here. Question the assumptions. Uh, and, uh, we want to make sure we're right according to the scripture. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, thank you for, thank you for coming on. Would you just briefly explain maybe kind of a, a general overview. What is dispensationalism? You know, we, we hear that word often, both in a positive light and negative light. And I think a lot of our, our people don't know exactly what to do with it when we'd say, well, he's a dispensationalist. Yeah, it, it is uh, one of those terms that is thrown around a lot and, uh, and yet not a whole lot of definition often given to it. And it's one of those things that depending on who you talk to, a dispensationalist is either at the right hand of the father or they are uh, the devil's progeny. Uh, progeny. Uh, and uh, it gets a lot of uh, bad press. It gets a lot of messed up press. And, uh, and uh, within dispensationalism itself, there is a huge range of what uh, opinions and various interpretations might be. But at its simplest form, at dispensa- and, and this, is, this is really at the heart of it, also dispensationalism is just a a hermeneutic, a method of interpreting the scripture that recognizes that at certain points along the way in progressive revelation, that God has given a a revelation that is so fundamental that it changes everything from that point forward. And uh, so a dispensationalist would look, would read the scripture looking for those particular points at which basically the rules of the game changed because of a revelation that God gave along the way. And uh, there are typical standard, uh, if you Googled it, you'd come up with probably seven dispensations. uh, But really, it would vary uh, among dispensationalists, uh, whether there's uh, three or four or seven or nine or 10. uh, And that would depend on on a person's interpretation of how fundamental they thought a revelation was and uh, when they, those came. But, uh, you know, to put it in the simplest sense, life in the garden was 360 degrees different than life out of the garden. I guess I should say 180 degrees different uh, than life out of the garden. Uh, it was completely going the different direction. And so a dispensationalist would say, okay, let's not mix that which is in the garden to that which is after the garden because we've got a new set of rules now outside of the garden. 
And uh, you would have the same thing uh, when you came, for example, to the giving of the law. Now there is the giving of the law and its purpose and uh, plan in the, in, the, uh, in the workings of God. And so you come unto the law dispensation and uh, later on the grace dispensation. And into the future, uh, you've got uh, the kingdom dispensation or the eternal dispensation, depending on various terminology that you can use. And so the, I think the key to uh, dispensationalism then is reading a portion of the scripture, looking at it and saying how much of that is only applicable to those living under that dispensation or under those rules, under that administration, and how much of it carries over, which would just be a general for all time, and interpreting every scripture really in that light. Is this for everybody for all time, or is this just, for example, for Israel as they're wandering in the wilderness, making that interpretation? So I would venture to say that even those who reject dispensationalism do some of those basic things of uh, how do you interpret this by the by the context, uh, and uh, so it's a it's a very literal, close context uh, reading and interpretation of scripture. So let me just clarify. So when you when you say that a, a new revelation comes along that changes everything after it, are we saying that God dealt with people differently in one dispensation than He deals with people in another one? Yeah, that's that's what I would say okay. as a dispensationalist. There's a few dispensationalists that would disagree with me, probably. I imagine you could find one out there. But um, again, using the uh, the Garden of Eden uh, and uh, post Garden of Eden as an example, God certainly dealt with Adam both before and after the fall. But his dealings with Adam after the fall had a different flavor to them, even and uh, different requirements regulate. You know, but Prior to the fall, the only regulation there was is don't eat from the tree of the of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, after the fall, you couldn't even get to that tree. So, how now do you be obedient to God? What do you uh, what do you carry out in order to be in a right relationship with God? And then I think you could say the same with the uh, call to Abraham, for example, or the giving of the law is such a such a, a stark one, like uh, like the fall, that you could say after the giving of the law, then. God, uh, working through Israel, says, okay, here is exactly what you do on the new moon, on the Sabbath, on the all these other things that uh, some, of, some of that, like uh, Sabbath observance, obviously had been since the beginning of time. But there were other regulations that were added in there that this is a new revelation. And now the one who wants to be right with God has to live according to the law as it's stated now, the revelation of God as it's stated now. And uh, then even even in our, uh, we would call our dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is the wording that Paul uses in the King James anyway, uh, in Ephesians chapter three, verse two. And he talks in Ephesians two, I believe it is, how the Gentile was once outside of the covenants of Israel and the commonwealth of Israel, and they were without hope, without God. But now the barrier wall has come down and there's neither Jew nor Gentile. And even that, oh, even that thought of neither Jew nor Gentile is would be fundamentally foreign to the passages of the Old Testament uh, that are related to God's uh, working with Israel. And so you see, okay, here's here's a new revelation that has now come in which uh, to be uh, right with Him in these days. It is uh, by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And uh, you, you've got this again, new uh, new method in which uh, God is dealing with with uh, man that comes through the revelation that God has given progressively. So, what is the what is the dispensational view of, of end times then? Yeah, the 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 standard, and this would this would probably be fairly uh, uniform within dispensationalism would be pre tribulational premillennialism. That is uh, a rapture of the church pre trib before the tribulation. And uh, the second coming of Christ then before the millennium, as opposed to amillennialism or postmillennialism, it would be a premillennial view. And I, I doubt uh, you would have to look a long way to find a dispensationalist who didn't hold to a premillennial worldview. And then among those, the vast majority, and again, I was 95% probably are going to be pre-tribulational premillennialists. So the pre-trib has to do with the rapture. The pre-mill has to do with the second coming of Christ. So dispensationalism almost has uh, become so well known by its eschatological view of pre-trib, pre-mill, that many people think that 
that is dispensationalism. And yet that would that would just be the eschatology of dispensationalism. And uh, you, I, I, I suspect you find uh, pre-trib, pre-mill outside of dispensationalism. So it's not unique view to uh, dispensationalism, but it is the standard uniform view would be uh, a pre-trib, uh, pre-millennial view in which uh, the church or the body of Christ is going to be raptured prior to the seven years of the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, and uh, then will various views on whether they return with the Lord or they remain in heaven uh, during the millennial kingdom, but that the Lord would establish physically a kingdom on earth. I I typically uh, will describe the future kingdom as future, physical, and fraternal. And that view of an earthly kingdom in which Messiah sits on the throne of David and reigns over the house of David and becomes then in that uh, role also King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that that is a, an on earth kind of thing, as opposed to amillennialism, which would make it more of a, a, a spiritual uh, kind of reign or an individual kind of reign. The dispensational view would take a future physical fraternal reign. And by fraternal, future and physical is fairly obvious. By fraternal, it relates to, it's, it's in and through the nation of Israel. And so another distinction of dispensationalism is that they do strongly hold to a separation between Israel and the church, that those are two different things, not the same thing. So I, I was going to ask, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the reason that the, the dispensationalism, the, the hermeneutic of interpreting the Bible based on the dispensations, and why that is so closely associated with premillennialism, especially uh, pre-trib, is because when you read the scripture, you're, you're looking forward to those fundamental moments where, where things change, like you said. So there's, there's exactly. a natural futuristic bend, right? We're looking forward. So naturally, everything <laughs> yes, becomes yes. future. Exactly. And there is a sense on which, of course, you've had those uh, unbelievable translation, uh, tr- transformations or, uh, or changes in the past uh, revelations that have been given. But people are, are normally forward looking. So the next, uh, the next major change that we see in Scripture, of course, is the, uh, the rapture and then the fulfillment of prophecies that take place after that. So one of the reasons that dispensationalists tend to have more prophecy conferences than anybody else <laughs> is because uh, a dispensationalist always will take prophetic scriptures and read them as future and physical. And therefore, they will see that some event that may be taking place in the world today or has taken place uh, is is somehow tied into some passage of scripture, which can be fulfilled. Now, dispensationalists have... Uh, done a terrible job at being accurate at uh, making those connections <laughs> and uh, many times have gone uh, wild and crazy and on a on a, a wild goose chase on some of these things because they made connections where they shouldn't have made connections but unlike for example an amillennialist who may look say at the restoration of uh, of Israel and see that as the the full people of God coming together and the Lord coming to receive them a dispensationalist would say no this is a future geopolitical event, which is going to take place among a, a, a certain ethnic group called the Jews. And so it's a lot easier to uh, bring about some testimony or, or some some uh, connection Bible teaching of a, a scripture where you're not uh, spiritually applying it, but you're physically applying it. Who would be some people that have held this view historically? I, I suppose some of the most famous would be uh, those like uh, C.I. Schofield and he probably did more to popularize the view than anyone else because he had the Schofield Bible that came out in 1909. And that was the, the first, not the, not the first study Bible, but the first widely used study Bible. Uh, going back to the Geneva Bible, you had uh, some notes in the margins and whatnot. But he, he managed to uh, put theological library in the same binding as, uh, as the text of Scripture, and it became wildly popular through especially the first half of uh, the last century. 
and so very well known. Dallas Theological Seminary has put out a lot of people that uh, would hold to this view at one time. It was uh, a requirement for entry and exit at Dallas Theological Seminary. I'm not sure that it is today, but at one time it certainly was. And uh, that would be people like Dwight Pentecost, uh, Charles Ryrie in more recent years. You can go back, uh, E.W. Bollinger, is uh, well known for his pre-tribulational or dispensational views. And actually, um, often uh, J.N. Darby, John Nelson Darby, is considered the father of dispensationalism, but almost always by non-dispensationalists. Non-dispensationalists appreciate Darby. He systematized dispensationalism perhaps more than others had done up to that point in about 1750. But the dispensationalism that Darby held is very different than the dispensationalism even that Schofield held. And uh, and yet some of the basic similarities as well. And uh, you even go back into uh, teachers like Irenaeus, uh, of course, that would be uh, what, second century, third century. And Irenaeus uh, had a, a number of uh, writings about a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Uh, Victorinus, I believe is how you pronounce it, one of the later church fathers about uh, the uh, about 240 AD or so, he wrote dispensational ideas. None of these, uh, you would, none of the early church fathers would you really call dispensationalists, but they held some of these ideas like a separation of the church from Israel, like a pre-tribulational rapture that they, they taught or at least interacted to see that these were there. In fact, uh, one of the uh, books we publish at Dispensational Publishing is uh, called Ancient Dispensational Truth. And it, it goes back into the early church fathers and examines some of their teachings. And again, uh, I wouldn't call Irenaeus a dispensationalist, but certainly he taught a pre-tribulational rapture. And some of these others dealt with it to know that the ideas go back. You alluded to this earlier, and I wanted to, you kind of talked about, you mentioned variations within dispensationalism. Uh, not all different people agree. And we hear terms like progressive dispensationalists or classic dispensationalists. Uh, could you differentiate maybe a little bit between uh, some of those variations? Or it, Yeah, I, I can. And uh, not only do you have the, uh, oh, shall we say, the uh, the broad categories that uh, are are somewhat well-known that you have given, but even within those, you would have a lot of different variation that it makes it hard to come up with and say, you know, this is a dispensationalist. Uh, but uh, progressive dispensationalism, I would say, uh, is mostly covenant theology, but it does uh, strongly hold to a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view. And uh, so it, it's it's basically progressive dispensationalism is let's take the the eschatology, but not so much any of the rest of it. Then what's often called classic dispensationalism would be uh, the dispensation of, say, Schofield, Ryrie, Dallas Theological Seminary with the seven dispensations. I don't really like the term classic, or, or sometimes they will call it normative dispensationalism. And the reason is that you take, for example, Schofield and Bollinger, who lived at the same time and both did study Bibles, the Companion Bible and the Schofield Reference Bible, and they, they, have, uh, they have different views of dispensationalism, different views of uh, interpretation all the way through. So which one was the, which one's normal, you know, which, which one's the classic? Yeah, they lived at the same time, wrote at the same time. And that would be true. Even, even the differences, say, between Ryrie and Schofield, and Ryrie sort of inherited the Schofield ball, if you will, uh, or baton on the, on, the, on the relay race. And yet uh, there's lots of differences between them. But that category of seven dispensations in a pre-trib, pre-mill would be uh, classic dispensationalism. There is, uh, if, if you were to look at these, say, left to right in terms of most open to most narrow-minded in terms of dispensationalism, I think you would go from progressive dispensationalism to, let's call it classic dispensationalism, to then what is often called mid-axe dispensationalism, which uh, simply uh, moves the birth of the church from Acts 2 to about Acts 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, right in there in the mid-axe period. And then, uh, there is um, some often called hyper dispensationalism, not by those who hold it, but uh, hyper dispensationalism moves the birth of the church even uh, someplace after the book of Acts closes. So there's that uh, disagreement about when the church starts. But I might say that that disagreement really is included. That's, that's a Christianity wide issue. If you've got uh, 
you know, the reformed uh, crowd together, or you got all of Christendom together, there would be a debate. Did the church start at Pentecost? Did the church start at the, de- at the resurrection? Did the church start with John the Baptist? Did the church start uh, with the giving of the law? Did the church start in the wilderness? Did the church start with Adam? And uh, so that, that in one sense, that's all a dispensational view, even though many of those wouldn't call themselves dispensationalists. Uh, where you draw that line does make a difference. So anyway, in a, in a short shorthand manner, I would put it from progressive dispensationalism to let's call them ultra dispensationalists in that category. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Are there some errors or some hold within your view that you would want to point out? I would say that the what what I would especially point out is errors of interpretation of the scripture that are used to support a particular view. Let me give give kind of some examples here. So I hold to a pre-tribulational, premillennial view, but many times when I hear my fellow dispensationalists defending the pre-trib, pre-mill view, I want to say, no, you're using a scripture that's not even about the, the tribulation or the rapture, and therein I hold the same view that there's going to be a rapture of the church, but you're doing great harm by trying to defend it out of that particular passage because really you can't get it out there. And so why use an argument that's not going to hold water in the end? And I think that especially if you go on the Internet, now this would probably be true about uh, any argument, but uh, you go on the Internet and you look up kind of the caricature of the arguments against pre-tribulational premillennialism, I would say we brought that about our, on, our, on our own because we were teaching rapture passages where there was no rapture. And uh, that messed us up. I, I remember early on, I rejected the pre-tribulational premillennial view because uh, I was told that, uh, you know, this came from uh, Revelation chapter four, verse one, where uh, uh, John was told, come up here, come up here and I'll show you. And I thought, if that's all you got to go on, then forget about it. I'm not, I'm not holding that from come up here. You get a rapture out of that. Now I realized there's a, uh, as a matter of fact, I would say Revelation chapter four, verse one is not a rapture passage whatsoever and should never even be come into a rapture discussion. So there's a lot of errors in uh, in uh, strategy of how you defend. And, and those come from errors of understanding of what the position is. And that just comes from uh, uh, not enough Bible study, honestly, <laughs> and uh, failing to uh, look closely and uh, and check a passage in its uh, grammatical, historical context, uh, literal context, and uh, putting that together. So I would uh, certainly put those errors. I think that's the uh, the other area of error within dispensationalism, and I kind of uh, mentioned this uh, slightly earlier, is that I think dispensationalists have been too quick to find current events and associate those with the rapture or the end times. And that has gotten them into date setting, which obviously have all been wrong. And a lot of uh, undue speculation about the meaning of this and that and the other. And uh, more charismatic dispensationalists would be John Hagee. And of course, a few years ago, he had the books out about the blood moons, uh, four blood moons or whatever it was. And that was based upon such horrible hermeneutics that really a good dispensationalist would, uh, would reject it right from the beginning. But there's a lot of, shall we say, sensational dispensationalism that, uh, uh, that accepts those. And I'll say as a, as a publisher, we don't publish those kind of books, but that sells books. You know, when you, when you say that this particular event is indicative, even uh, uh, the Harbinger books that were so popular, uh, number, and I suppose still are popular, Rabbi uh, Kahn, uh, forgotten his last, his first, Jonathan Kahn, I believe it is. Well, he built the entire Harbinger off a passage in Isaiah that had zero to do with the United States of America and nothing to do with the end times that we live in and nothing to do with the church. But he said some things that were sensational and titillating and almost kind of what we want to hear because we want to hear that somebody's going to come and fix this mess. And there's such a desire to get our world fixed that lots of error, those, those interpretive kind of errors, either supporting our positions in the wrong way or reading into the newspaper biblical, uh, biblical significance that should not be there. So we were going to ask about some unfair caricatures of your position with the sensational dispensationalism kind of fall into that category, you think, I mean, cast all of dispensationalism. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, 
I think so. Uh, it uh, casts what I would call a real dispensationalism in a bad light. The, the, the unfair characterization, and again, I mentioned this earlier, but is that premillennial pre-tribulationalism is dispensationalism. So I would take, for example, a John Hagee and say he's a pre-tribulational premillennialist, but uh, he's a charismatic sensationalist, not a dispensationalist. And, and, and yet you're kind of thrown all into the same camp. I suspect that just about any camp has to deal with that uh, guilt by association. And, uh, you know, that's not really our position. And uh, yet you get that. I think that in my own experience, to go on the Internet and uh, read about dispensationalism almost in any one of its forms, you're going to get a flawed understanding and so many straw man arguments that are that are given that I think it would be uh, uh, a fool's errand to try to uh, figure that out. I think I think the, the better thing to do would be to take some of the positions of dispensation. If you're brand new to dispensation, take some of the positions and then try to work through that biblically and uh, see what's done and, and, and look at it and say, uh, you know, okay, here's pre-tribulational premillennialism that's built on, I don't know, let's say Matthew chapter 24. I, I don't think the passage that talks about uh, two are in the field and one, one is taken, the other remains. I don't think that's a rapture passage. I wouldn't use that to defend the pre premill position. So you got to really be discerning and look and say, okay, here's a fellow who takes it as support for it. But is it, you know, does this, does, do these all things all come together? And fortunately, most of us live long lives. And therefore, we don't have to figure it all out today. We can change our positions. We can uh, deal with it. We can wrestle with scripture and try to come. And I think the heart of dispensationalism ought to be we are people who go to the Bible and uh, read it literally. And if the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense, as we often say. And then we try to connect the dots. But every theology is connecting dots that aren't just fully connected for us. Fortunately, the dot to dot in the Bible is not numbered, and that's why there are theological differences. And, and we all ought to recognize that, that whether it's a Reformed position, a covenant position, a dispensational position, it's based upon some interpretive assumptions. And if we got any of those assumptions wrong, then the whole thing, the whole thing falls apart. And the, the older we get, the more we study, the more we uh, look back and say, oops, you know, I shouldn't have put that. I shouldn't have connected those two things. Now I see that. And so I'm going to change my position. And I don't know, maybe it's pride, but for some reason we have a hard time changing our position or backing up on something that, uh, especially those of us who are preachers, because we stood in front of a crowd of people and, you know, staked our life on it. <laughs> but I, I think we ought to be practitioners who are in the word, learning it, studying it. And uh, sometimes we go back and say, oops, uh, messed up on that one. Appreciate that humility. Is there kind of one thing, you've said a few things, is there one thing that primarily drives your view of, of end times? I, um, first of all, I wrote a little booklet. It's a small booklet uh, called uh, Why I Am a Pre-Tribulational Premillennialist and You Should Be Too. <laughs> and uh, the title is almost longer than the book. And in fact, if anyone uh, from your uh, podcast wants to uh, contact me, Randy at randywhiteministries.org, I'll send you a free copy of it. And in that, I describe a little bit of my journey coming to pre-trib, pre-millennialism. I think whatever position you take on the timing of the rapture, the, the fact of the rapture is, is pretty clear in First Thessalonians chapter 4. We will be caught up. And the, the term rapture, of course, comes from uh, the Latin of that translation, which is rapturo. And so that catching up, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, will be caught up, will be snatched away, whatever, whatever term, uh, harpazo is the Greek word. You have to, you have to say, okay, somebody's going to be caught up sometime. <laughs> so then that passage doesn't tell us when you have to then say, okay, what's the timing of this event? Is it uh, after the tribulation? And then you even get into, you know, what's the nature of the tribulation, uh, is, uh, the is the last 2,000 years the tribulation, or is there a future seven years? There's so much that goes into it that this is not something that I, I think that if someone uh, thinks they can solidify an end times position in a uh, two-hour Friday night seminar, they're fooling themselves. There's just way too much in how, in how do you interpret this determines how you're going to interpret this, how you're going to interpret this. So for me, I, I figured, okay, there is a rapture. And then I looked at the various positions of where are we going to put that rapture? And uh, 
I came to the conclusion after a long time, because I was uh, what was uh, what is often called a historic premillennialist or a post-trib premillennialist for many years and came to the to the the conviction that uh, no, that the pre-trib is really what works biblically and puts all the passages together in harmony. But it's a harmonizing of scripture. And again, that's uh, the vast majority of doctrine is a harmonizing of scripture. And uh, I think that it would do anybody good, even if, even if they're not a uh, a dispensationalist and reject dispensationalism altogether. You gotta have some kind of eschatology in order to have a biblical worldview. And biblical worldview obviously is important. You know, where where did we come from? Where are we going? If I can't answer that question, then uh, you know, especially as a pastor, and I would I would forgive the youngest of pastors, especially who are who would who might just honestly say. I haven't figured out the end times yet. That's that's okay, you know. Uh, so figure it out later. But somewhere along the way, we as pastors uh, who are trying to help people understand the world we're in, we're going to have to uh, figure figure that out and be able to deal with uh, with some of the things and some of the weaknesses to the position and the uh, strengths of the position and flaws of the position and what the other positions are and be able to deal with that uh, in a uh, in a real healthy way. Well, I was going to ask. Uh, we were talking about kind of backing up, I'm, I was thinking about the God dealing with people differently in disp- different dispensations. Is there a particular soteriological ex- perspective associated with dispensationalism? Or a per- It depends on who you ask. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'll answer in a way that I would say the majority of my fellow dispensationalists would disagree with. Most, I think, dispensationalists have the flaw of thinking that there has always been one soteriology plan of salvation, that it's always been by grace through faith, not of works. And it's almost anathema in American Christianity to say anything other than that. But my position is that salvation, as the three of us know it, and and, uh, those in our audience uh, know it, that this salvation is something new that God is offering now to the individual that comes after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that prior to this uh, this dispensation in which we live, the uh, salvation that was offered was not an immediate individual salvation, where we might sing, I don't know, in my tradition anyway, we have a song that says, uh, my life now is sweet and my joy is complete, for I'm saved, saved, saved. And we can say, you know, I'm saved and sure I'm saved. And, you know, this is the day I got saved uh, and uh, talk about the experience. And, uh, you know, if I die today, I'm going to uh, go to be with the Lord. Uh, All these assurances that we have of salvation. Well, if you look into the Old Testament, I would contend that what you see is a future salvation that is offered. And in the Old Testament, they died and went to Sheol. And uh, Sheol had, by the time we get to even the Gospels, we know, uh, you know, the place of torment and the place of uh, uh, Abraham's bosom or the place of paradise. And uh, they were awaiting the resurrection, at which time they would be judged. And then at, then at that point, determine, are you going into the kingdom or are you uh, going into uh, eternal damnation? Which, uh, which direction are you going? So I would say that uh, up until the time of our dispensation, there was not a really a salvation offered. So you ask me, how were people saved in the Old Testament? And I would say they weren't. (laughs) This is why you don't really find uh, any of the prophets uh, standing and speaking or the Psalms or anything else standing and speaking, you know, hey, now is the time to uh, accept the gift that God is offering of salvation. You just need to believe that someday he's going to send his son to uh, die, be buried and rise again. As a matter of fact, you know, usually dispensationalists and, and covenant theologians, because I think uh, the majority of dispensationalism adopts a covenant theology here. Usually they will say those in the Old Testament just looked forward. We look back. But I would challenge the audience to say, uh, look at, find the evidence that they were looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, yeah, I, I think it's not there. Even the apostles, as Jesus says, you know, we're going up and I'm going to, they're going to take my life and I'm going to be buried. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Very clearly says in the Gospel of Luke, they didn't understand what he was talking about. If they didn't understand it, they certainly weren't placing their faith in it. Uh, they were looking for him to establish the earthly kingdom and uh, bring about the judgment. They wanted to be right with God through the judgment and uh, enter into salvation through that way. So I would call that in the, in the um, 
the Gospels do call that the gospel of the kingdom versus what you and I would have the gospel of grace that uh, we share. And so I would be uh, farther on the right end of the spectrum of uh, dispensationalists in that regard. And uh, again, most most uh, who would call themselves classical or normative dispensationalists would uh, would would even strongly disagree with me on that. So since there's there's varying, like you said, I mean, you, you would disagree with your brothers and sisters in within dispensationalism on, on some of those issues. But then what about an all millennialist or a, a post millennialist? I mean, where do you can you cooperate with them in, in ministry? I guess, where does the role of dispensationalism or this this perspective come into some of those things? Can you where's the line at on cooperation within? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, one does not need to adopt dispensationalism in order to receive the gift of grace that God is offering. <laughs> and uh, so we have brothers and sisters in Christ who hold uh, all sorts of wrong ideas. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and we can and do walk with them and enjoy uh, the uh, the Christian journey with them and learn together with them on so many uh, things. I actually think that uh, one, and especially those of us who are pastors, we benefit probably more from reading a different point of view than reading our own point of view, because we already had that point of view, you know, let's find something different. Let's see, let's see what the millennialists say about this, the post millennialists say about this. And that often, for me anyway, it strengthens my own argument, because I say, nah, you know, I see the perspective you're coming from, but uh, here's the, here's the bad assumption you made and, and, and go through that. Now, I think that, in, I think there's value, especially in a local church of figuring out what the position of that church is, and yet recognizing that there are other churches that uh, hold a, a, a different position. And that's, that's, uh, that's fine. And that's the reason that there's church A and church B and church C is that these people can fellowship without constantly having to arm wrestle on something. And yet uh, when it comes time to uh, serve the community, to uh, celebrate the birth of Jesus or to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we hold the same views on it. The person of Christ uh, it pretty much uh, throughout uh, Protestant and, uh, and evangelical and even fundamentalist uh, Christianity, we hold the same ideas of the Trinity, of the person of Christ, and largely even of, of the gift of uh, salvation. There's some different viewpoints on, you know, how you receive that gift, uh, but and what's involved there. But uh, I think it's a value to have a local church that has taken a position and works to defend it. And you can fellowship around that position and that can be your identity. But at the same time, being able to work with others. And I, I wish in the Christian uh, community, there was a little more openness to saying, I'm going to get together with an amillennialist and we're both going to uh, get down on the wrestling match, uh, on the wrestling mat and, uh, and try to work this out and uh, defend our positions and try to, to seek to learn these. You know, the, the, the Jewish rabbis uh, have a method of Bible study that's very different from those in Christianity. They will take the Torah, especially, and they've, they've broken the Torah up into an annual uh, calendar. And when it comes the week to t- study that Torah portion, they will look, here's all the competing views on this. And so they're very well versed in it, unlike most of Christianity that just says there's crazy people out there called amillennialists, but we don't agree with them. But not really being able to understand where did that position come from? How, uh, how do you defend that position according to this? And, and really dealing with those uh, various ideas, Christianity needs to be more open to having our ideas challenged. And for whatever reason, we, uh, we, we're, we're not strong at that. As, as a matter of fact, I would say, in one sense, debate is a good way to do that. And uh, yet in another sense, there are so many weak-kneed Christians in the pews that you put a debate out there and it just rattles their soul and they can't handle it. And we need to strengthen ourselves to be able to say, hey, you know, we're big boys and girls. We can, de- we can deal with uh, a competing idea and, uh, and probably even strengthen our own or get rid of our own, you know, if it can't hold water, then let's dump it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. We, that's kind of one of the reasons why we're doing this, this series on the podcast is we want to, we want to give a, a platform yeah. to, you know, we don't think that one's the eschatological perspective is necessarily a, a first tier issue. And there's some freedom here. Right. And, and we think that this is something that's important, though, it needs to be thought through. And we want to help people think through this issue and 
And what better way than to have guys like you on who, and one thing I've really appreciated about you is, is even though we may disagree on the end and not see eye to eye, but one thing that is very clear is that you take the Bible seriously, that you, that you love the word of God and that you're trying to, to point people to scripture. I really appreciated when you talked about how, yeah, there's, there's these guys out there that believe in the rapture. They, they believe that the same position, they hold, they hold my position, but they're getting there the, the wrong way. And you know, that just, that just says, you know, this is a guy that takes the Bible seriously and he's interpreting the Bible rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. And there's something we can agree on is that we all need to take the Bible seriously. Yeah. And I think in all, uh, all walks of Christianity, there are those who really do take the Bible seriously. And, and they, we all bring a different set of lenses, so to speak, uh, in uh, reading and interpreting it. And uh, I think it helps in interacting with others who hold a different idea. I think it helps us to say, okay, I understand the lens they've got, even though I don't carry that. I'll give an example. C.I. Schofield in the Schofield Reference Bible holds to a gap theory. We don't have to get into all the issues about the gap theory, but I reject the gap theory. And yet I think the Schofield Reference Bible, if you're going to have a study Bible, that's the, that's the one to get, uh, get a Schofield Reference Bible. So I'm able to take that and say, I disagree with him on Genesis chapter one, uh, verses one and two. I think he got that, that wrong. But I used, to, I used to think, oh, he just did that to accommodate science or some uh, uh, leftist loon issue that got, got a hold of him, shame on him. But now that I, I, I did decide, I'm going to go back and see how in the world could you ever come up with that view? And I find, okay, he's got a pretty serious outline from scripture that says, okay, here's, here's where I hold it. Now, you know, I look at that and say, okay, I see where you're coming from now. I didn't make this assumption and that's why I don't hold to the position. But uh, having an appreciation of an understanding is good. And dispensationalists uh, and dispensationalism does suffer from... Mm bad PR, if you will, that uh, there are people who, uh, again, create these straw man arguments. And I think, I think all of Christianity would be well served by understanding each other's position better. That does not mean we all have to come down and hold the same position. I don't think we're going to, because as I said two or three times now, doctrine is an interpretive matter. All doctrine is an interpretive matter. There's really not a doctrine that there's one chapter and one verse and that settles it all. It is, uh, well, how do you interpret that? And how does this relate to that one? And uh, what happens if you uh, look at the scripture in that way? And, and uh, it all becomes a matter of interpretation. And there's, uh, there's a right interpretation and a wrong interpretation. We ought to figure out what that is. But some of it, to borrow from the words of Paul, you know, now we see through a glass darkly. And uh, then we shall see face to face. And uh, we, we struggle as uh, practitioners of the word in coming up with uh, that which which makes the most logic in terms of uh, biblical interpretation. Well, really appreciate you being on. Thanks for thanks for coming on and sharing uh, your view. And and I would just say that the the first Bible that I got, my parents gave me, was a Schofield Study Bible. I remember. In anybody in South Dakota, their grandparents had a Schofield yeah. Study Bible. Uh, that, that was the uh, yeah. standard throughout the American Midwest, especially. That was the one that everybody had. And. Uh, I, uh, I I think God's the greatest benefit of the Schofield Study Bible is not mm-hmm. the notes. I almost never use them. The greatest benefit is the, ref- oh, the cross reference system in the middle, uh, in the middle column. Uh, that it's got uh, just excellent cross references. And a layman out there who uh, you know is all of a sudden you know their pastor calls and says, "Hey, I'm sick. Can you preach today?" That reference system would enable a person to pick a topic and say. Today, we're going to talk about uh, whatever it is, the rapture. <laughs> and uh, here's, here's uh, those, those scripts. And you could, you could uh, pick uh, items that would not be so controversial as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, really, it's a yeah. great reference. Well, thanks a lot. Good getting to know you, Andy. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I appreciate uh, being with both of you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find more out about us or check out past episodes on the web at renewalcast.com. You can connect with us on social media. For instance, you can go to facebook.com slash renewalcast. Have a great week.